Hello and welcome to this continued series on best practices in software, in gaming, and specifically inside Unity. In this video, we'll take a look at a demo inside the Unity editor that I covered in the last chapter. I'll do a recap of some of the concepts around best practices that we've discussed already, and then we'll take a look at the demo itself. Now, you may already be familiar with best practices throughout software that include principles, standards like coding standards and project structure, having different patterns, frameworks, and even architectures inside your game projects. Then specifically with Inside Unity, we talked previously about putting your project on version control, using the latest LTS version, tweaking some of the project settings, including enter play mode options and the challenges that come with adding that, and then also structuring your project and using the packages that work best for you. Now in the workflow area, I like to have a project where any given scene can be started and entered directly inside the Unity editor without needing to visit any bootstrap scene. So you have to construct your game in a way for, for that to be able to be possible from the beginning, let's say. But once you do that, you're able to develop much more easily, always being able to run the current scene and getting a full representation of the game. So the sample game that we took a look at in the previous video, we'll jump into Unity and take a look at it here. Again, we have a main menu scene that allows you to play the game or customize the character. This is a configurator type of a solution where you would be able to design perhaps what your character looks like, maybe some of the game rules or the environment look and feel, and then being able to play the game itself. In this case, you move around with the arrow keys. There's not much of a game to this. It's really just to explore the separation from the menus to the in-game and being able to have all the data properly synced together. In this case, however you design the look of the environment and the look of your character, that same look and feel comes into the game scene itself. So let's see this in action inside the Unity Editor. So here we are, I've got the latest LTS of Unity running the free sample project that is available, link below. Some of the things that I wanted to mention here, in addition to the project structure, following the best practices that we've discussed, and each individual class file following our coding standards. I wanted to mention something about that project setting that I mentioned. So in project settings, under the editor tab, we can come in here and typically a game will not have this checked. This means that every time you click play to run your scene, it does the longest process possible with the cleanest process possible to restart your game scene. So watch, I'm gonna load up one of our game scenes, let's say our menu, and I'll hit the play button here. So I'm clicking play. And I would say less than three seconds. This is a very simple game, but less than three seconds between clicking the play button and us entering play mode. If we do it again, and again, I've, I've done no asset changes, no coding changes, I'll do it again here. Again, maybe it's two seconds and something. Now on an early project, it's not a big deal, but as you add particularly art assets into your game, but as the code and the complexity of your game grows and grows, those two seconds can easily become much, much longer. And that means that every time you're iterating as a developer, you have to sit here for two seconds every play cycle, or 10 seconds every play cycle, or 30 seconds every play cycle. And there's lots of time lost. And some of that can be gotten back with some best practices, including simply checking this option. Let's compare. I'll come here. Now this is the way that I like to configure all of my game projects. I have this checked on. Now there's some other sub options here. You can read the documentation and see more about them, but this combination here is the fastest results. Now I'm gonna click again. And it was maybe a little hard to tell in the video here, but instead of being two to three seconds, it is uh, instantaneous. I'm not even able to measure the time. I'm stopping and starting it. You can see the color of the screen change as I do that. So what's happening there is that Unity is purposefully skipping some of the steps in that initialization process. And it's not just extra speed for free. You do need to do some things as a developer. So if you follow the best practices link that I'll put below, you can see exactly what you need to do there. 
and a spoiler about it, it's about how you use static variables and cleaning them up properly. That's one of the key factors involved. So I just wanted to mention that there. Now I'll play the game, I'll make it a little bigger for us. So here in runtime, I'm able to hit play game and use the arrow keys to move our character around. Notice we're in a black and white world here. And that's really all I can do is drive them around and that's it. Now, of course, this is simple gameplay. There's not really any win conditions or loss conditions, but it is an example of the types of things you would need to do inside of a game. If we go back here and we go to our customized character option, here it's showing a unique layout without the background. Now that specific detail is not so important, but in each of these scenes, I tried to think about, well, what would we need to have in this and being able to have a subset of all the systems be able to run at a given time. If you design your game in the cheapest, fastest way possible, it might break, let's say, if the player is present, but the background is not present, depending how you have organized your references. But this scene properly and cleanly has just the parts included that you need. And we have one button here that is a randomized character button. So as I click it, it just filters through some different color options. So let's say I decide that's the, co the character that I want, and I go back to the game. Here on the front screen, we see properly that that character is properly colored. We are actually skipping scenes here, but it is reconstituting the proper look and feel of the assets. So then we'll go to customize environment, and here, same thing, we start with this black and white world, and I would be able to customize it here again. So let's say I like this purple and green look. And again, I come back here and it brings together the character I've customized and the background I've customized. And then we'll go ahead and play the game again. And here, same gameplay as before, being able to move the character around, do different things, but with these assets uh, in their proper colors. Now, interestingly, if I stop the gameplay and I start again, it remembers the color from the last section. So. That is not so specific to uh, the needs that you might have in every single project, but it is a nice demonstration of being able to have persistence across your game. So imagine this is a game template that you would begin every project that you do. And by having these different systems in place so that each scene can be run independently, let's give that a check actually, because I wanted to mention it. So if I unplay here, We've only started from the menu system every time. What if I jump right to the game and I hit play? It loads, no errors, and it properly colors that scene. Now the colorization is just a symbolic representation of all the different game state that the game would need to load up. And you can imagine in a complex game, there could be a lot of different systems that need to come online at that point. And from this system, everything is operational. I can go back, and that properly takes me back to the main menu. Let me give just a second example of that. All of the systems can be run directly, but let's say I was working on the customized character scene and I wanna go directly to it while I'm working on it as a developer. Now, the combination of being able to use those enter play mode options, as well as being able to go directly to one scene at a time, means that I can go right in. It loads not with a two second delay, not with a 60 second delay in a larger project, but a very quick time. The game is operating uh, well, being able to jump right in and showing me all the full features of this scene. Now, in some implementations of this on some projects, you might find, uh, well, our team made it so that I can skip to the scene, but when I go in, it doesn't offer me that top bar that allows me to change scenes or whatever, because there's an amount of time and energy that's spent to make all these features come online in all cases. But if you design your project from the beginning with these things in mind, having a restart button that restarts your game state, having that developer console that completely resets the game logic, whatever it is there that helps you practice out those different iterations, when you have that in day one or week one of your project, then six months down the road, because you've been testing in that environment, your code is that much more bulletproof. It's able to run itself from different situations. Your character models are able to properly configure themselves from different situations. You end up creating something that is more universal, more flexible. If there's anything else I wanted to mention here, uh, let's see. Uh, I did wanna show that I also have full unit testing for the project. 
So if I open up our general test runner, so here there's a suite of edit mode tests, which I can run. It steps through and it runs those are all run. They run quite quickly because they're running not on mono behavior related code, but more low level math operations and stuff like that. But lots of different things that are served there. And then if I go to the play mode test, one of the interesting things about the play mode test, this is quite cool. I don't always do this because it's not always feasible. But in this case, one of the tests, what it does is it loads each of our five scenes individually and makes sure that not one of them throws a null ref. So you can imagine, let's go ahead and take a look at that. If I go ahead and run it. So you can see here, it's actually stepping through the scenes. It's quite cool. So it was able to run that with no errors. It's quite awesome. And we can see that one test, it is in this all scenes test. So let's imagine here a very, very common scenario where here in the customized character, maybe the reference from the uh, HUD is lost. So I'm just gonna purposely break that. This is the kind of thing that happens all the time as artists and programmers update your code, they might forget to drag in a new reference. So if I was to run this one scene directly, I would get that. But maybe someone broke a prefab and that prefab is only used in the third scene out of the five. So how would you always be able to check that? Well, it's good as a team to have some smoke tests and some practices where you go through and you play the game from A to B. But just as an example, let's look at this test. So if I run this test, it goes through and it steps through each of them. And we can see here that because what I changed was something in a prefab and that prefab happens to be used in two of the scenes, those two scenes failed. So not every team has unit testing set up and not every team has them automated. So here I'm manually running inside the Unity editor, but imagine that every time one, or one of the team members commits to Git, that these tests get run automatically, which Unity supports that. And you can do that with lots of different frameworks, but including Unity's cloud build service. So if somebody on the team makes an innocent mistake like that and doesn't happen to be working in the one scene or two scenes where that happens, that the next time anybody commits to the domain repo, that's gonna get kicked off and you're gonna get warned about this issue. And the earlier you catch these kinds of things, the better. It is so much more cheap to catch these types of errors early in the first hour that they happen instead of the first week that they happen or let alone shipping it to your users, that it's just, it's worth its weight to set up these types of processes. So that's the end of our demo here inside Unity. And that wraps up this topic as well. If you're interested in what we've discussed here, you can take a look at this best practices link, which brings together a lot of the different concepts that we've talked about here, including that sample that we've seen, and also applies the different theory and gives you lots of different material that you can go deeper into any one of these subjects that you found particularly interesting or that you think would offer you or your team a lot of value. So that's it. Thanks a lot.